Welcome everyone for joining us this morning on this uh, webinar of the series organized by the King's Japan program at uh, King's College London. My name is Alessio Patlano and I'm the director of the King's Japan program and the reading um, East Asian Water and Security at the Department of War Studies at King's. Um, I am particularly delighted today because during these times of uh, lockdown and social distancing, reading a book is back on the menu as a good thing to do in order to have some quality time. And the reason why I'm delighted is that the book that we're gonna be talking about today is a really good book. So that really means something in terms of quality time coming your way. Um, but uh, in order to um, introduce you um, to some of the contents of the book, um, we have today um, the author, and I am very pleased to welcome Professor Rory Metcalf uh, from the Australian National University. Rory, welcome and thank you very much for joining us today. I know that in Australia it's quite late in the day, so I'm particularly grateful for you making the time uh, to connect uh, with us. And to make the conversation, the discussion about the book even more sparkling, I'm uh, super pleased to uh, uh, introduce Professor Sir Lawrence Friedman, um, Emeritus Professor of War Studies at King's College London. Rory, good morning. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, Thank you very much. The book, um, In the Pacific Empire, China, America, and the Context uh, for the World's uh, People of Region, um, I think is bringing to the table a number of different topics and, and themes that are uh, incredibly um, timely, um, if anything. And perhaps uh, during uh, these few last few months of COVID-19 becoming a pandemic, um, some of the core themes in the book um, are likely to remain incredibly relevant for the foreseeable future. One thing that I took away um, that was for me, for me very important is the idea of trying to reintroduce notions and concepts related to, to the conceptualization of space and how space affects the way we look at international politics. In international security studies and international relations for a long time, um, the idea of geography or the relationship between geography and strategy, geography and, se and security um, has been perhaps long forgotten a bit too much. And in this respect, um, in the Pacific Empire brings us at the very heart of what the implications of looking at international security and international relations with an element of geography in it uh, may be all about. Um, the rule of the games are as follow. For the next 15-20 uh, minutes, Rory will introduce the uh, book and uh, Rory will then comment on it. And on the back of that, we will continue the conversation with all of you following um, us um, through the webinar. Um, the Q&A uh, section is open, so you can easily sort of uh, 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 send us questions directly um, so that I will be able to sort of uh, bring them to uh, the speakers. Rory, without any further ado, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Alessio. And it's a real pleasure to be with, uh, with you all and with this group and, and a particular honor to, um, to have uh, Lawrence Friedman, to have, to have Laurie uh, introduce uh, or frame the conversation. Uh, not only uh, are we um, colleagues from some time back and uh, I really uh, value the visits you've made to Australia over, over the years, Laurie, and the um, work you've done uh, with us at uh, various institutions such as Lowy and ANU, mm -hmm. but also it's a little known fact that your uh, evolution of nuclear strategy was uh, one of the books that really got me into this space um, back in the dim dark days of the late 20th century. So thank you. Um, look, <clears throat> what I'd like to do in the next uh, little while is introduce some of the core themes of the book. Um, inevitably, this conversation, I'm sure, will go to current and future challenges and the whole COVID-19 context, that massive strategic disruption, and whether it will be an accelerator of trends or indeed a, a rupture. But I want to first set the scene with, I guess, why, uh, I guess, geography matters so much and why geoeconomics uh, matters so much in what many of us imagine as the Asian strategic space, why this is of global significance and why it is in some ways a China-centric conversation, but also, and this is where I think the interests of my own country, Australia, come into the, play, into the puzzle, and why I think this is a conversation very relevant in Britain and Europe and globally, uh, 
why multipolarity uh, is increasingly uh, the name of the game as, as well. And really, what are the, the challenges and choices ahead for, um, for China? So if I can cover some of that space in the next few minutes, I'll be happy. And to help me in that, um, and I'm going to share the screen of my uh, computer here for a moment, I'm going to share a few of the maps that really uh, are the mental maps that are, that are the guideposts for, for the book. So let me just do that and um, try to bring up some, some images that um, I think will, will help. So the, um, the book is divided into three parts and it's, it's a, you know, a classic past, present and future framing if you like. But it's using, using the, the return, and I believe there is a return to a two ocean uh, framework of maritime Asia as the, um, I guess, the, uh, the portrait for the strategic narrative for the past really 20 to 30 years now. The book argues that, as you can see in this first map, that the uh, the connectivity between the Indian and the Pacific Oceans and their repositioning as arguably uh, the global centre of strategic and economic gravity, or really of economic and strategic gravity, that is what has brought about this reimagining of what was known for some years in the late 20th century as the Asia Pacific. It's reimagining as the Indo Pacific, playing China in particular into a much larger strategic space. Uh, bringing China into contact and increasingly competition with a wide range of other powers, uh, and of course India, but not India alone, feature in that um, in that framing. Uh, and of course, I note that there are India-China frictions even today, uh, although at land rather than at sea. And then finally, creating this um, framework for thinking about empire and the international edition of the book that we're talking about today, Indo-Pacific Empire, um, of course, is a bit ambiguous about whose empire do we mean? But I think one question I want to raise in readers' minds is, is, uh, is, is Xi Jinping's China essentially uh, an empire in the making or even a colonial project on, on speed? And therefore, can we look to the history of empires past and wonder whether in fact, China is, is carrying the seeds of um, the failure of its, uh, its ambition to dominate uh, the Indo-Pacific region. The, um, the idea of the Indo-Pacific really returned, and I say returned because this is actually an old idea, returned uh, into vogue in statecraft uh, over the past decade. And Australia, seven years ago, and this map is uh, in fact uh, borrowed or uh, adapted from an Australian defence white paper, was the first country formally to declare that its region of strategic interest was the Indo-Pacific. It matches our two ocean geography, but it also reflected the fact that the wealth and the power of the big states around us, particularly China, uh, were being projected now across the two oceans and the energy uh, transport routes, the, the trade routes and so forth, and more recently, the big infrastructure power play of the Belt and Road reflect that. In the last uh, few years, we've seen then a, um, a, a rapid, uh, almost acceleration of countries, other countries redefining the region in this way as well. Their own variations, the Japanese, the Indians, uh, the Americans, importantly, when uh, the Trump administration three years ago, uh, I guess, declared its interest in an Indo-Pacific region, but even others, Indonesia, e e France, uh, some voices in Europe. And I think there's a healthy debate in the United Kingdom at the moment as to whether its engagement in this part of the world is through this two ocean lens. Um, I argue, uh, and we'll go through a few other maps in a moment, I argue that this is in many ways about mental maps. It's about the framing that decision makers, that leaders have in their minds, uh, that strategists have in their minds when they're conceiving of uh, what is the geographic extent of priority interests, what is the kind of power projection uh, that they need to think about, who are their potential competitors, who are their friends, what are the regional structures and organisations that matter? And 
a lot of the, as the book argues, a lot of the framings of uh, an Asia-centric region, a maritime Asia-centric region over the years, uh, regardless of the name, have had a really interesting, um, a striking similarity, a resonance throughout history. And so this modern idea of the Indo-Pacific, actually uh, much of the book argues, is in a sense a return to uh, a norm throughout the history of maritime Asia. It was a two ocean region, a region where the connectivity between South Asia and East Asia, between uh, Chinese civilization, Indian civilization, Southeast Asian civilizations, was much more, uh, if you like, of a, um, a, a continuous band of contact rather than separate sub regions that were broken up and uh, had very little traffic with each other. And we'll come back later as to why this actually matters for power and power competition today. But just to take a journey throughout some of that submerged history that the book retells, if you look at this particular map of framing of the region from the early 15th century, uh, a Korean map, uh, and you can, the clue there is the fact that there's a very large Korea and a very small Japan uh, in, this, um, in this particular depiction. You see essentially uh, East Asia, South Asia, Southeast Asia, really as one um, as one unified uh, one unified block. In fact, a very small Africa over there with a gigantic lake in the uh, in its centre, and an interesting emphasis on the archipelago, on seaports. So even before the colonial the European colonial era, there was this this proto, if you like, Indo Pacific going back to previous civilizations, the um, Hindu and Buddhist empires of uh, what Europeans would consider to be uh, the Dark Ages and the medieval period, but a flourishing, flourishing commerce and strategic and diplomatic interaction in Southeast Asia from South Asia. Then of course, China's uh, early forays into the Indian Ocean, uh, the treasure fleets of Zheng He and so forth. But importantly, the book argues that although the maritime mattered greatly in that history, that economic and strategic history, uh, it was not uh, a China-centric region. China had tributary systems in East Asia, but never was able to sustain uh, a full system into South Asia and the Indian Ocean. So the book is partly intended as a corrective to the uh, fairly much the propagandist view we get out of China today, that China by right is the dominant power across this very, very broad region. The historical narrative continues, of course, through the colonial period. Um, and it's striking that fairly much any depiction of Asia from really the, uh, the early, uh, early 16th century right through until the 20th century, uh, almost always captured this single frame of South Asia and East Asia of the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean as one system. Uh, because this was the system, obviously, that mattered to commerce and politics and the power of the European empires. It was also a system that mattered to local societies and civilizations. And just as colonial, uh, colonialism <clears throat> quite brutally broke the, uh, the, the system uh, that held sway in Asia, broke uh, a lot of the connections between Asian societies, it also bound them together again with the global system of commerce uh, and, and geopolitics that essentially laid the foundations of, of the present um, era. I particularly like this map, of course, because um, it, uh, from 1571, it has a tiny little hint of Australia in it. Um, and even then the Dutch map makers uh, knew that our beaches were quite good. It's labeled beach, but it does play North America, South Asia, East Asia, Southeast Asia, all into that one Indo-Pacific um, frame. Moving forward to, I guess, uh, more, more, more recent times, as I said, the era of colonial empires consistently looked uh, at this two ocean system, uh, a map, an Australian map from 1848, uh, which in fact was written, was, was um, produced by the, um, the explorer who was trying to find a route to uh, export cavalry horses from um, Australia to India, an overland route. Um, showed our connections with South Asia, with East Asia, with Southeast Asia, all as being equally important. And there's a fascinating resemblance between this map and the framing that the Australian government 
likes to use today, and even more intriguingly, uh, the framing that China uses when it looks at a very, very fresh worldview, um, a maritime Asia-centric worldview, uh, a map that accompanies the Belt and Road. And we'll come back to this Chinese map in a moment because if mental maps, you know, if, if maps and the, the artificial, at one level, division of regions um, as units of organisation in diplomacy and strategy, if they reflect a kind of strategic wish-making on the parts of the, the nations that dominate that map-making, this Chinese map um, of a world where, interestingly, the um, American continent is, um, is sundered and um, cast to the outer edges of the universe uh, and where the Indian Ocean is at the centre of things with its connectivity, its resources and so forth, this could be a very interesting signal of what is to come. And this map was in fact produced in China in the year that the Belt and Road was established in 2013. It's a state sanctioned map, uh, popular with the Chinese Navy. Um, and you can see that uh, it pivots just as nicely as the Australian map does to capture um, some of the unity, the continuity of maritime Asia. Why does this matter? It matters for a few reasons. I mean, the book makes what seems to be a, an obscure argument, and that is that we're no longer in the age of the Asia Pacific, we're in the age of the Indo-Pacific, and some will say, well, so what? Um, but it also argues that this explains um, part of the imperative of China's, it's, it's very ambitious strategic power play, and also explains why it's actually going to be very difficult, if not impossible, for China to dominate the much larger regional space that it is seeking to dominate. We all have heard of the Belt and Road. Um, <clears throat> China spends about $10 billion a year um, to tell us about the Belt and Road, uh, the signature initiative of, of Xi Jinping. The Belt and Road, of course, is about, um, it's about infrastructure, it's about investment, it's also about influence, uh, Chinese uh, geoeconomic power play. And many of the Belt and Road's advocates argue that in fact, the land and the sea are equally important in this vision. The, the road is the sea, the belt is the land. Um, I would argue that in fact, for a number of reasons, the sea will continue to outweigh the land, not least because of the, um, you know, the extraordinary uh, cheapness and efficiency of sea transport and the special uh, versatility that sea power has. And that China's maritime Silk Road is really uh, the Indo-Pacific with Chinese characteristics. Ever since uh, in 1993, China became a net importer of oil and began to look out and to look east, sorry, to look south and west and across the Indian Ocean. The seeds of this Indo-Pacific era were sown. And when in 2008, the Chinese Navy began to make that journey, uh, that journey into the Indian Ocean uh, ostensibly for counter piracy, but also to protect China's energy interests and establish, as we now see, the beginnings of a permanent military footprint in the Indian Ocean. China was becoming an Indo Pacific uh, military power as well. I'll conclude on a few points about what this means for, I guess, the future of power relations in the Indo Pacific and the interests of many countries uh, caught up now in this opportunity for new kinds of multipolar collaboration to limit Chinese influence and also to manage American dysfunction. Because uh, you know, the Indo-Pacific means many things to many people. It's become a popular shorthand in some ways, and some argue that it's really, really just a shorthand for balancing Chinese power because it legitimizes, for example, bringing India into strategic balancing arrangements with, let's say, Australia, Japan and America, the, the quadrilateral dialogue, or perhaps other arrangements too. My argument is that uh, the Indo-Pacific is first and foremost a reflection of the, uh, the connectivity and the expansion of China's own interests and presence uh, across the Indian Ocean, into South Asia, into Africa, into the Middle East, and the naval uh, and maritime power that China is seeking to project now to protect and advance those interests, and the, uh, the clash or the coexistence of multiple major powers across this two ocean strategic system, 
where the interests of every trading nation are engaged. And that's where, for example, uh, the United Kingdom comes into the picture. It's also in some ways, and I don't like to use the, the word microcosm because the Indo-Pacific is an enormous space and that's one of the criticisms of the concept, but it is a laboratory, a very large laboratory for China's power relations with the rest of the world more broadly. Uh, it's still, I think, difficult to say whether China genuinely aspires for global dominance, but it certainly aspires for regional dominance in the Indo-Pacific region. And the extent to which new arrangements among the many middle players of this region, the countries that are not the United States or China, the extent to which these players can actually uh, at least moderate China's, um, I think, more assertive uh, power plays, and also can encourage uh, a more constructive re-engagement in the region by the United States, and to some extent, provide some hedging and some insurance against a diminished American role in the region. That whole dynamic has lessons for the global system as, as well. And so, you know, I wouldn't be a, um, a narrow geographic determinist and say that essentially, uh, ultimately it's geography that matters in global power politics, but geography is returning as a major factor in the Indo-Pacific as the place uh, more than any other where I think that is the case. Final point, which is about the, the future. So the book went to print uh, on the 8th of January uh, at a time when, of course, uh, perhaps not even the um, senior leadership in China knew exactly what was going on with the, uh, the COVID-19, what became the pandemic. And in some ways, I think this now provides a moment to really question all of our strategic judgments about balances of power, about the economic bases of power, uh, really about the, the, the priorities and the effectiveness of a whole range of countries, including China. We had that initial moment where we thought this would be a, a China-centric and China-contained problem. Uh, it wasn't the case. It became everyone's problem. And, in, and there are plenty of countries that appear, according to official figures, appear to be faring worse than China, although, of course, there's, there's no knowing what China's real data is. At the same time, though, the experience of the last few weeks has shown, or last few months, has shown, I think, a new appetite for um, coalitions and creative coalitions to protect their interests, push back, and also protect what there is of a rules-based international system. Uh, in the Indo-Pacific and globally. And there are perhaps a few examples I'll, I'll come back to in the, um, in the discussion on that. But let me leave it there. Um, and what I'd love to do now, I'll switch off my, my slides and um, rejoin you for the conversation. Matthew, you. Yes, um, Rory, thank you very much for um, a very comprehensive overview, a uh, very fair one also, a very articulate and complex uh, book. I, there was one line there that for me sort of sums up everything that, that somehow you were saying. Um, it's true, we're no longer in the century of the Asia Pacific, we're in the century of the Indo-Pacific. And in that sense, behind that simple line, there's so much uh, to uncover. And this link uh, or shift uh, that the maritime and the maritime connectivity element brings about, I think it's central to many of the points you've raised. Uh, Laurie, what do you think? Uh, well, first, I think it's a great book. Uh, I learned an awful lot from it. Uh, I like the historical perspective. I like the geographical perspective. You, you pulled back at the end from the from the former Kinder. You, it's uh, um, it's not determinist, but but it reminds us, which I think in Europe we can often forget, uh, not only just how big this area is and, and the distances involved. But how much that that shapes perspective. Uh, secondly, I think the, um, in a way, it's an argument that probably is now almost won everywhere except in China. Um, that this is probably the best way to view this part of the world. Um, narrowing it down um, doesn't help very much. Uh, uh, it overstates Chinese influence and potential, and I think that that point is is very effectively made but it's a point that still needs made because to some extent there's there's a uh, I mean, there's a, I mean though you mentioned 
Rory, the, the, the American sort of adopted this terminology, uh, a lot of the American debate is about strategic competition between the United States and China with not much of a looking for anybody else. Um, the, I mean, the, the point came home to me when reading Alison's Thucydides trap, uh, which is all about this transfer, um, which he expects to, for what he believes now is going to be disrupted between the US and China, between this global hegemons or whatever, but it just completely ignored uh, India and Japan and, uh, and all the other parts. And there's lots of balances in this part of the world, not just one. So, uh, I, I mean, I, it, it reinforces a view, uh, something I've had for some time, um, that uh, the sort of superpower perspective that uh, the middle range powers uh, uh, are lesser powers uh, doesn't help us very much, in, in, especially in circumstances where China, in some ways, surprisingly, given I would have thought how well the quieter diplomacy of the previous era was going, uh, has decided to become much more assertive. Um, the, the sort of, if we can talk about antibodies in the system at the moment, um, one of the reasons why um, uh, this has become strategically such a, a fascinating uh, part of the world is because you can feel the pushback against the assertions of Chinese power uh, in ways that they might have avoided uh, by just being a little calmer and quieter. Um, and uh, it's, uh, I mean, I, I don't think Z. Is, is that well understood as a political player uh, and his ambitions are not in Europe? And you know, when, when you're being compared with Trump all the time, everybody can look reasonable. Um, but uh, and he's made a very, a very strong power push, and uh, both internally and uh, uh, in terms of his own position and externally. And, and he's playing for very big stakes, I think. And how this works out is quite interesting. I wanted to make um, a couple of points. First, you, you, you mention American dysfunction. Um, and while we're obviously, and I, I, the other point I want to make is connected with, with the virus. Um, but uh, I think we're, we're about to enter an incredibly important period um, in, in, in international history, but, but particularly in American history. Um, what happens in, in November, it, it matters a lot because uh, I'm, I'm not personally convinced that American institutions um, and uh, power can easily survive much more of this. Uh, I mean, this has been a pretty bruising period and it, it's, it's, it's not, you, know, you don't have to use melodramatic language to realize just how, how serious this is. And the um, a mismanagement of, of, of Asian relations by by Trump in all sorts of ways um, has uh, created anxieties and aggravations that, that mm -hmm. uh, might have been avoided and, and, and we'll have to see. I think there'll, there'll be an appetite if, if Biden wins to um, uh, retrieve the situation. I think the, the people will be very quick and keen to do that. Um, but it doesn't, in some ways doesn't bear thinking about what happens otherwise. Um, I think we, we, the, the question of the impact of, of COVID-19 is, is, is really, I mean, we're at the start of something because whatever happened to the health crisis, we're now in the mother of all economic crises, which is going to go on for, for some time. Uh, but the health crisis isn't over and, the, uh, and even China has had to acknowledge uh, the, 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 they haven't, as they were claiming, beaten the disease. It's quite interesting just to look at, at the shifting narratives around this. I already mentioned this a bit, that it started off uh, as a really nasty China problem, um, then it became an Asian problem, then a European problem. Now it's, uh, it, it's uh, slowly but surely becoming a developing world problem. Um, and uh, but initially the view was uh say february that this is bad for china um that um 
they'd lied to their own people, that the, they hadn't been straight with the rest of the world. Um, and then that sort of shifted because uh, as, as we were making our own mistakes, the, chi the Chinese could claim to have done uh, uh, an effective job in, in, in ways that we couldn't necessarily em emulate, but they, they, they were sort of bragging about it. And I think that this is now caught up with them um, because uh, people's memories aren't quite as short as they may have hoped. Uh, and the fact is that, that um, having had the experience of SARS when they were too, in 2003, when they were too slow to tell everybody, they've done it again. And uh, again, made it all made our own mistakes, but it doesn't alter the fact that we wouldn't have had the chance to make these mistakes if, or not as bad if, if China had acted more openly and explicitly. And, and you can see that in the, in the recent WHO meeting, um, that nobody wants to go along with the Americans and, and shut down WHO. Um, uh, but uh, nor are they going to let China off the hook. The other thing is, uh, is, is the Belt and Road. Um, I mean, the, the, the amounts of debt that people owe China is staggering, staggering mm -hmm. amounts. I mean, I, it's well over $500 billion. Um, quite a lot of it taken out quite recently, not always at very generous interest rates. And, and um, lots of countries are now starting to ask China for forgiveness on their debts or, or, or at least restructuring. I think this is going to be a really big issue um, for with a lot of countries. Um, you have a complication, which I, I, don't, I think the Chinese saw the danger of, of the sort of ethno-nationalism within China leading to some pretty unpleasant incidents with African students and so on, uh, which African countries noticed that it sort of fits in with a, a narrative you hear in Africa quite a bit about Chinese racism. Uh, but leaving that, that, that part of it aside, um, you know, is China just going to seize assets <laughs> around, uh, around the developing world? Um, I don't think it's going to be quite an economic hit. I don't think it can forgive them. I mean, these are debts greater than, you know, the IMF and the World Bank. And this is big, big business. Um, and it's going to take a lot to get all of this going again. I mean, so I think that this seems to me to, is likely to be one of the big stories uh, of, of the next year. And, 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 and I'd be interested in Rory's view about how this feeds back with an internal Chinese debate, because you mentioned in the book uh, a lot of misgivings within China, within Beijing, about whether this was really such a wise thing to do and a sort of profligacy in, in um, handing out loans, keeping your own construction companies going. Uh, well, you know, some of these projects have now had to be stopped. And I, I think it's a, it, it's a, it's a really uh, interesting question. Let me just my final point, which is sort of more, more a European one. I think what I've been, I mean, the antibodies reach Europe as well. Um, and you can see that in the UK debate, which I'd say for the, the first half of the, of, of the past decade, going in really until a few years ago, was really anxious to do whatever deals it could do with China, seeing it as a pretty, you know, this is the economic powerhouse, best to be part of it. Uh, but there's quite a lot of pushback, and um, partly it comes back to COVID-19, um, but it's also the, 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 the sort of the wolf diplomacy as well, the, the, um, the, the uh, reluctance uh, to accept any slight against China's good name um, uh, and to uh, insist that uh, everything that it has done is for the best in all possible worlds. And this is causing quite a bit of uh, a pushback. Uh, it's becoming a major issue within, uh, within, within the Conservative Party now because of the question of 5G and, uh, and so on. Um, and, it, and it creates really interesting questions about how this might, because nobody, and again, it's an important point of the book, no, nobody thinks China is a power that in some way sort of be defeated or you want to see it humiliate. I mean, it's, it, it's got to be an important part of all dialogue and, and international cooperation and so on. But when you can't when you lose trust in it, uh, and as you mentioned, you can't, you can't trust the data. There's now a number of reports of scientific publications being censored because it, they don't fit the narrative of, of uh, 
it possibly wasn't our fault in the first place and we dealt with it brilliantly. Um, I think for all of those reasons, um, uh, the, there's a scepticism. So I, I think this is uh, uh, really quite a critical time for Chinese diplomacy, whether they can sort of regear a bit to re-engage uh, in, in ways that uh, uh, don't alarm people so much, and and uh, and if they don't, I think the uh, all the all the uh, uh, Japanese, uh, Indian, Indonesian, Australian, etc. linkages that, that Rory Port uh, points to in what again is, is an excellent book uh, will become even more important. Thank you very much, Laurie, for, for, for your comments. I, again, there's, a, there's a lot of science that comes up um, in the conversation. I think three points that you were making, the fact that, uh, first of all, one of, the good, one of the strengths of the book is that it is not just about the major power competition, it's also about everybody else. And, 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 and the point you were making that with US leadership being questioned, there is not an automatic transfer towards China, which increases the importance of the question for everybody else, guys, what are we doing? Uh, how are we sort of going to step up to the plate in that sense? Um, and of course, the question that for China is not an easy pathway towards the top uh, as it was imagined or discussed uh, even just a few years ago, because we're starting to see all the problems that come with the growing Chinese um, influence and impact on in international politics and geoeconomics. The point you were making about the incredible debts that, that are accumulating around the developing world. And, and the third point is that you raised the question of how all of this, until very recently, it seemed to be almost um, a, 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 an element of conversation in Europe, almost on the sidelines of everything else. Whereas right now, it's gaining much greater um, central focus in ways that we've never seen. Put it this way, even the, 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 the ruling party, even the Tories here in this country at the moment, have at the moment about four or five different you know, school of thoughts about China. And he, you asked me this question two years ago. I don't think anybody would have sort of imagined that today we would be where we are. So I think the, the book is very important in that sense because it really fleshes out the importance of everything else other than major power competition being at the center of the conversation that we need to have. Um, Rory, um, while you gather your thoughts as some reaction to Rory, let me also raise uh, uh, one particular question that has already, actually two questions that have already been uh, typed in, which are linked to some of the points that um, uh, Rory raised. Um, I'll start with uh, the one about Singapore, um, in which uh, the, um, uh, James is, is saying, uh, my country Singapore is in a very similar strategic position as Australia, facing similar pressures, it enjoys a close security partnership with the United States, while simultaneously being economically intimate with China. Consequently, like Australia, we are under increasing pressure to choose sides. How viable is our continued hedging strategy? And related to this, uh, there's another question from Charlie um, about the impact of COVID um, on uh, the middle players, as it were. Um, countries like Australia, Japan, India, ASEAN even, um, um, uh, can they see in what is happening with COVID some sort of an opportunity? Any specific new agenda items for the next uh, planned or rescheduled strategic meetings like ASEAN summits, um, ARF, um, ASEAN regional forum, ASEAN and US summits, and bilateral high-level meetings, like uh, the two plus two formats. In other words, is COVID, with all the points that both you and Laurie were making, is possibly creating an opportunity to, to widen, strengthen an agenda of bilateral and multilateral sort of relations in the region? I'll start with these two. Laurie, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. And um, look, thanks uh, to, uh, to Laurie for that, um, that, that generous praise as well. And I'll, I'll, I'll begin by addressing, um, I think, Laurie's key question about the, uh, I guess, the fate of the Belt and Road, and then I, 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 that I can then, I think, lead into a few of the other questions. So, you know, the thesis in my book is, uh, firstly, you know, at one level, a, a different description of the region that has, in fact, a, um, a historical uh, validity. 
But the question then becomes, what do we do with that? And I think in China's case, you know, China is in fact, it doesn't like the term Indo-Pacific, but it is prosecuting an Indo-Pacific strategy and a Eurasian strategy at the same time. And this is not sustainable in my view, because there are a whole lot of factors that are on the horizon for the Chinese leadership. In fact, I suspect when you think about the many things that keep uh, Xi Jinping awake at night, uh, you know, the demographic time bomb in China, uh, debt both in China and indeed those debts that will never end up being paid to China, uh, environmental pressures, and the whole question of dissent. You know, China's got this very angry periphery, uh, which we've seen uh, inflamed over the past few years. You add those factors to um, the, almost the impulse, I would say, to build an empire um, on speed. And it's an impulse that comes from the fact that the party's legitimacy, and particularly the legitimacy of this, um, this hyper-authoritarian leadership, comes in many ways from demonstrating uh, Chinese greatness on the world stage. And I can't think of another great power, if you like, whose external, um, certainly not in the current era, who, who, whose need to project some kind of external assertiveness and dominance is so wrapped up with the survival, not just of the, of the regime, but of the system at home. So these are the kinds of um, contradictions that the book has pointed to. And I think in many ways, the COVID situation actually accelerates um, the, the narrative on a lot of these. Yes, we see uh, a certain degree of Chinese hyper defensiveness and hyper confidence at the moment. And of course, my country is going through a very um, interesting and unpleasant brush with that right now. But I think there are plenty of other countries who will have their turn or have had their turn already. But in fact, um, this could be this, 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 rush into hubris could in fact bring the reckoning much sooner than the book projected. The book really talked about the 2030s and the 2040s as being the time when, um, you know, if you like, a turning point could come. Uh, but it could be sooner now. And I think even though the other powers, and this is where I'll get to that point about the options for Singapore, Australia, the other middle players, even though we're all suffering and there will be grievous economic harm to every country um, over the next few years. Um, I think in many ways, we're also all going to be tempered by the experience. And I don't mean that in a pleasant way, but I do think in fact that um, a lot of countries are discovering their capability for suffering and for ruin and for sacrifice in ways that um, certainly a lot, of, a lot of our citizens over the last 10 to 20 years really could barely imagine. So it's actually going to become harder, I think, for China to use the tools that it uses of actually quite limited coercion to um, change our policy settings, to affect our interests, uh, because we're already enduring in some ways the, the kinds of, um, of damage that China is threatening us. You know, this wolf warrior diplomacy we hear about, and we're having that here in Australia, it's a very odd kind of big bad wolf warrior diplomacy because in many ways the house is already blown down and the big bad wolf is huffing and puffing at us when it's already inadvertently done a lot of harm to our economies and societies through its failure to control the pandemic. So this is all a recipe for, not for uh, containment, not for um, overconfidence on the part of the rest of the world, the middle powers, middle powers, the democracies, and others, countries like Vietnam, which are, which are not democracies, but it is a recipe for uh, a renewed kind of patient confidence, um, not just waiting out China, but a confidence that in fact, China is risk averse too. China has pretended over the past 10 years uh, that it's willing to take all sorts of risks. But if you look at the true story, in the South China Sea, in the East China Sea, in the confrontations with India, and there's another one on right now. Um, you know, China has this paradox of having an impulse towards um, a kind of expansion, but at the same time, a risk aversion. Um, the PLA hasn't fired a shot in anger, as far as we know, um, since the, the, the 1980s. Um, against Vietnamese Marines or Chinese students. Um, 
this is a powerful military, but it's not tested. And I think the leadership, in fact, is nervous about testing China. So the recipe for the rest of us is, I think, to use this present time to uh, strengthen and diversify our web of partnerships, to build webs of dialogue and interoperability and trust, uh, really as creatively as we can. Um, and going to that point about the impact of COVID on the middle players, a really interesting little green shoot that I'm seeing at the moment is the establishment of a quad plus dialogue. India, Japan, Australia, the United States, Vietnam, South Korea, and New Zealand that confers regularly on COVID response, on COVID management within our countries, and I suspect increasingly on questions about uh, the strategic picture, supply chain security, and so forth. There will be many more processes like this, and the challenge will be really uh, to coordinate them and put substance behind them. So I think we're at this, I think I agree with Laurie that this is an inflection point, but it's also the start of a, a very long game. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Rory, for all of this. And I, I have a, quite a few questions. So what I will try to do in the, um, because I'm conscious of the time, try to, to bring them together. And, but before I do, just to, would you say, basically picking up on your very last point, that perhaps China is, is, is a tactically opportunistic, mm -hmm. or the way to reconcile right. this tension, the, 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 the ten, the, a way to reconcile the tension between the country that looks really sort of, as you say, in this first towards expansion, but in the very risk averse overall conceptualization of its action, perhaps you could say that tactically it's, it's very opportunistic. And as a result of this, whenever you got an opportunity, you try not to waste an opportunity and you see that sort of um, more aggressive or assertive behavior. Um, but it is operationally more sort of denial oriented um, in a way that it doesn't want to expose itself um, too much. Um, now, uh, going back to one of the points that you raised in your talk about the quads, um, I have quite a few questions about it. So I will try to sort of bring them together. Um, and because we have still quite a few questions, what we'll try to do is if we can sort of like shorten up the answer so that I can try to squeeze in as many as possible. Um, two questions on the quad really are about whether the quad is still relevant in a post-COVID environment. Um, and um, in particular within this context, um, uh, Will the sort of COVID-19 context accelerate a conversation within the Quad to make it even more multilateral? And, and attached to this, there was another question um, about the Quad um, in which um, one of the key points that was asked was, one thing is about is, is facilitating people coming together in terms of a multilateral security context, but another different thing is, transforming that coming together into an operationally viable tool of statecraft, the two not being the same. And um, where do you think we're going starting from the Quad? So is the Quad going to survive post-COVID? Is it going to open itself up? What does it need to actually deliver in terms of being a viable tool for, as part of the broader regional architecture and security terms? So I'll, I'll, I'll sort of cut to the um, the chase in a way. I mean, the quad the quadrilateral dialogue is criticised for two contradictory reasons. One is it's seen as threatening to China. It's the nucleus of an Asian NATO. It's the um, you know it's the posse. It's a containment strategy. The other criticism is that it's just a conversation. In fact, that it's weak. It's all bark and no bite. That none of the quad members uh, certainly. Um, in the Quad framework are ever going to take risks on one another's behalf. I mean, yes, US and Japan, US and Australia have alliances, and we obviously put a certain degree of confidence in those alliances, but the Quad itself is never, you know, for example, India is not going to come to Japan's rescue in the East China Sea, or Japan to India's rescue on the border. Um, now, you know, I think in some ways, a lot of that is asking the wrong questions, because um, we shouldn't fetishize the Quad. Um, you know, I've never known a, uh, a meeting to be, um, you know, more words to be spent describing a diplomatic process than are actually expended inside that 
process. But the Quad has done one great thing, and that is it's made the world safe for just about everything else. Um, you know, it's been the phantom menace, as I've written. Um, China's put all of this attention on the Quad. A lot of the real action is going on elsewhere. It's the bilaterals, it's the trilaterals, it's the whole web of new security arrangements and dialogues in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and it so happens that we've achieved almost a quad by stealth through all those other arrangements. And we're finding other countries, Vietnam, for example, creeping into those arrangements too. So I don't think we need to fixate on whether there'll ever be a quad alliance. Um, I do think the quad isn't going to go away, but it's a dialogue that keeps strengthening. It's now at ministerial level. Um, it's getting into more sensitive issues. I think it's fair to assume that it doesn't just talk about um, disaster relief or, or naval activities. There's this whole spectrum of issues such as such as 5G, such as uh, geoeconomics, such as technology, such as supply chains, such as COVID response, where I think the Quad will be useful. But it's the Quad Plus, it's all of the other arrangements, I think, that are going to be important. And in many ways, it's really about Chinese choices, China's behaviour and choices. Um, it's unlikely that we'll see the Quad steadily move to a much more formal alliance system. There is increasing, I guess, military exercising among various Quad members. But what we'll probably see instead is opportunistically, in response to Chinese activities, mm. statements and, I guess, gradations of response by either uh, twos or threes or fours of Quad members, other countries in the region. Uh, and really signals uh, setting limits to Chinese behaviour. In time, and this goes to the wider question of the book in a way, I think the, this, this tension between China's uh, risk aversion and yet its impulse uh, to assertiveness and expansive assertiveness, I think the way that this reconciles, and it's probably not reconciliation, it's more of a kind of a... Um, uh, a, um, a friction, the, the way that this uh, resolves is going to be in incidents that China can't control um, because the Indo-Pacific empire, if, if we assume it's China we're talking about here, and, and the Eurasian empire of the, the rest of the BRI is going to lead to a proliferation of pressure points where expectations are raised that China has to do something. You know, Wolf Warrior is in fact the Wolf Warrior movies, or in fact the second Wolf Warrior movie, recommend it to all viewers here, is a fascinating kind of um, Rambo-like window onto Chinese public expectation on the PLA. And it's not for nothing that the making of Wolf Warrior 3 has been stopped by the Chinese government because they don't want these expectations raised further. Whether it's in Africa or South Asia or the Indian Ocean or the South Pacific or Central Asia, China's and China's interests are going to get into trouble and there'll be an expectation on the PLA to act. And of course, as we all know from military history, um, size isn't everything and you just cannot control the situation once those first shots are fired. So I do argue that um, the Quad members and the other middle powers have to hold the line, strengthen our linkages and in some ways be ready for those occasions uh, when, when China stumbles because they're coming. Rory, I couldn't agree more. I mean, the, the point you were making just there, and, and perhaps it's, 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 it's symbolic, but at the same time, it, it gives you to think in a country where the government has uh, many fingers in, in different pies at, at all times. So this idea that Wolf Warrior 3 at the moment is, is kept under wraps and, and, and nobody knows whether it's going to happen or not. But at the same time, uh, we've seen from satellite imagery that the build-up of the base in Djibouti continues to be carried out. Really speaks to the point you were just making. It's a country that at the moment is struggling to find a way to continue to increase its influence without at the same time raising questions about expectations uh, of being more involved in international security. Laurie, would you like to jump in here and uh, if you have anything to add before I go to the last round of questions? Uh, yeah, um, well, I haven't got a, a lot to add. Uh, I mean, Djibouti is one of the most indebted of all countries also to China. Um, I think that, I mean, one of the interesting things to, is the sort of anti-globalization movement as well that, that we now have to sort of crank in, uh, which is different from the one that we thought 
this isn't the Occupy movement. This is everybody looking at what's happened over the last few months and wishing that they had their own supply chains and uh, more resilience and so on. Plus the fact that they can't afford as much as before. So I think the um, how this reshapes trading relations is is uh, is also an important part of this. Uh, I haven't got an awful lot. I mean, I, don't, I mean, I haven't got anything to disagree with on, on what Rory said. I think you know, was it in Libya? Uh, uh, not quite a decade ago, less than a decade ago. Um, that the Chinese got got into trouble and, and, and other people had to help them out. Um, it, I think it, if you have direct interest in a lot of your people, I mean, you know, they, they have exported quite a lot of people in order to be part of these infrastructure projects. Um, then you create risks. You create risks of hostage situations, of uh, local violence and disturbance, uh, of your local clients. Uh, getting into trouble. I mean, Rory you know, talks about these sort of things. Um, and um, uh, it, it only takes one of these to go wrong mm. when, when, uh, when everybody else is watching that you get quite a lot of blowback. And whereas I think, you know, uh, up till recently, there would have been everybody sort of rallied round and, and you try and help and, uh, and, uh, because who knows who else is going to get into these sort of situations. I, I think you know this this is china's um strategy you live with it you make it work uh so i i, I it doesn't take very much you know, what, one crisis in the wrong place and you get a very different uh, perspective on, on china's strength the crisis in the right place they may look very strong you know it, it, it it's uh, there's an arbitrariness about this the the, the but, but it's something that that, that i think will um will, will grow but you know i think you just have to keep on coming back to a to the economic circumstances which allowed china to grow so fast and effectively don't mm -hmm. obtain in the same way anymore and, and, and that you know cranking that into our calculations is going to be hard because there's so much more to be understood yet um mm -hmm. but i'm sure that's as worrying as anything else in in beijing um, I have uh, this one last round of questions that uh, really will sort of allow us to slowly draw the different threads together. And I'd like to keep you both on because one certainly will concern the both of you. Um, very briefly, there's a question here. The US alliance system, uh, the hub and spokes, as it were, um, was constructed in, in, in a, if you want, in a, in a conceptual framework that was very much Pacific, Western Pacific oriented. Um, is it changing or should it change now that we're moving into a context of an Indo-Pacific framework? Unfolding from that, there's a specific question about British defense policy and strategy, uh, which I think is quite important in the sense that how is this all that is happening at the moment, on the back of the debate that we were already having in this country last year, going to affect British broader defense diplomacy and you know, defense engagement, if you want, in the area uh, in years to come. And, and the specific um, uh, element of this question, which I think is very important, concerns uh, the idea that the first deployment that the um, QEC task group would have done would have been towards the Asia Pacific. Um, do you think that what is happening over the last few months will affect that and in a way will bring the British government to be more careful and perhaps postpone that deployment to avoid uh, getting unnecessary attention? And the third question, which sort of like bounces off from the previous two, really is, given what we've been discussing so far, in what areas you think that in Europe and sort of the wider, broader West uh, we have overstated PSC's influence, and conversely, in what areas we have underestimated um, the speed and the rapidity of, of Chinese influence. And here, I think the question at the moment in this country of, of the 5G, and in particular, the, the, the risk of uh, 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 companies in, uh, being overtaken aggressively by Chinese counterparts, as it was the risk a couple of weeks ago with the small uh, but very important 
uh, microchip manufacturer here in the UK, I think it's, it's, it's a very topical question. So are the alliance systems that were built during the sort of West Pacific conceptualization uh, in need um, of a rejig and is that already happening? Um, what does this all mean to the UK in particular as we consider that the QEC first of all and was bound that part of the region um, what is the impact on defense engagement of all that is happening and have we underestimated China in some respect have we underestimated it in others um, you go first Laurie uh, you should have the last word anyway Rory um, I mean, quickly on, on the on the US alliance um, I mean, it's obviously an issue, also the difference between Europe and um, Indo-Pacific, we'll now call it, uh, is that in Europe, the US is an, an alliance in, in uh, the part of the world that it, it's got alliances, and that makes an enormous difference. Um, but in both cases, the sort of commitment, especially in the nuclear field, that the US took on in the 1950s mm. um, are are problematic. I mean, they, I mean, put simply, if the question was being raised now, they wouldn't be taken on because these are high risk commitments. Um, they're accepted because they're sort of part of the of the order of things, it's the, uh, and they've worked. I mean, the alliance system has been has been good. Um, it's helped maintain a degree of order, but um, the doubts that Trump has expressed are not unique to him and i'm not sure will will go away to some extent the way that he's expressed them means i think they're now then they're, they're now out there it, it, you, it's uh, it doesn't matter so much as long as there are big challenges being mounted um but if things get um more tense more conflictual um then i think uh the problematic aspects of alliance uh, especially in, in in terms of nuclear guarantees, uh, certainly won't go away. On the UK, on the on the UK carriage, well, one of the things we've learnt uh, over the last few months is uh, aircraft carriers aren't necessarily a good place to be in an age of COVID. Um, the the, the uh, uh, Americans and French have had, uh, uh, and probably others have had some trouble in that regard. Um, I think. The um, I, I, I think if you, you look at the way the debates are developing here, I think the idea that the UK is going to go charging off as an independent strategic actor um, just to assert freedom of navigation is is, uh, is overstated. I mean, we, we we have to work with others. Um, a, an awful lot of the carrier concepts. Uh, depend on working with the US. I mean, it, it, it's very integrated with it, with American thinking, uh, indeed with American uh, aircraft to a degree. Also with the French, I mean, there's a lot of discussion, quite interesting discussions with the French, uh, because I'm not, you know, if we sent these, if we had a serious task force, um, we, we wouldn't be able to provide the, the, the uh, escorts to go with it, so don't have enough. So I think that, I think that there's some quite interesting questions that will open up there and it's important that Europeans show that they have um, an interest still, uh, strategic interest in what goes on, but they're going to be bit players. I mean, I think it's unwise to project that they could do much more than that, but you know, they, uh, it doesn't mean to say that, that they should be absent. On, um, I think this question of Chinese influence, um, you know, it, it's partly, Threats, but it's partly inducements, and you know, there's um, the Chinese have been able to uh, put a lot of money into things, and um, it, it's not something that can be ignored. Some of us are old enough to remember when the Japanese were the ones who were supposed to be doing all of this in the late 80s, um, and they've just bought everything in sight because it seems so cheap, <laughs> given the way that their currency had been uh, overvalued. And um, it didn't in the, in the end, it ended up not doing them a lot of good because the economic conditions changed in part because their currency become overvalued. Uh, so uh, I, think, I think what's happened is that, is that the, the Chinese are not in a stronger position economically as they were. I mean, I think that just 
stands to reason from what has happened. Their, 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 their budgets are going to be under pressure, their, 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 their internal debts, um, the trade isn't going to be, they're in recession now, the, um, the trade is going to take a long time to recover, consumers are not going to be buying as much as what they want, scepticism has grown about what they can offer, about whether it's uh, a lot of their a lot of their stuff is as good as it's, it's claimed to be. This is one of the problems with some of the Belt and Road initiatives. The infrastructure isn't that good always. Uh, so, the, so there's more scepticism and that gives, um, that gives Europeans and others a bit more leverage. You, you, you don't, you know, you've got to, you can look to other places, you can think about doing more for yourself. So again, you know, my hope would be that you just have a more balanced conversation with China. You don't, you know, it's not a question of shutting it out or ignoring it. You can't. It's, it's too important, uh, and there's too much mutual gain to be to come from cooperation. But you just have to hope it's a bit more balanced, uh, and that the Chinese don't push their luck, um, mm. and don't assume, as you could re reasonably have assumed from the behaviour of many European countries, including the UK, um, up until the last few years, um, that the Europeans are just. Um, you know, uh, kowtowing, the, 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 we, we want what they've got so badly that we'll agree to anything. I just don't think that's the case anymore. Mm. Um, and hopefully, hopefully that will that'll lead to a, a more balanced relationship. Wonderful, thank you very much, Laurie. Uh, Roy. Yeah, look, I, um, I don't disagree with those observations. I'd, I'd say three things then. I mean, on, on the, the Alliance system, uh, you know, the book makes the argument that, in fact, again, a lot of the great power relations uh, in maritime Asia were often playing across the two oceans. It's just that perhaps because from about 1970 until uh, sometime in the last 20 years, we were calling it the Asia Pacific and we were thinking about East Asia and treating the Indian Ocean as a separate space, we weren't really noticing it. But of course, if you were the, um, the Russian Navy on their way to the uh, Battle of Tsushima or the um, Great White Fleet, um, you know, 100, over 100 years ago, you were, you were doing Indo-Pacific things. Uh, the First World War at sea was an Indo-Pacific war and so on. The, the role of India in, um, or Indian volunteers in defeating Japan in the Second World War was an Indo-Pacific thing. So the US alliance system itself, um, although it was more East Asian, from the very beginning, if you think about the involvement of Australia as a US ally, an Indo-Pacific country with, with an Indian and Pacific Ocean um, shore, uh, was an Indo-Pacific alliance. And so the role of Australia now is actually becoming more important in the US alliance system because of our extraordinary vantage point at the, the fulcrum of the two oceans. Secondly, it doesn't have to just be allies uh, that the United States engages to, um, to balance China. And if the US were smarter about this game, as it sometimes has been and perhaps yet could be, it's going to find the right way to engage India. India doesn't have to be an ally, it just has to be India in order to complicate life for the, um, for, for the Chinese. And I think just to wrap up on that US point, despite the, you know, the despair, in fact, that some of us see it the way America is at the moment and the way... Uh, that, that Trump has been uh, degrading American power and prestige. Uh, there's still an enormous amount the United States can do uh, in this region, and I suspect uh, that if the US comprehensively competes with China, it's, it's going to have to stay in the Indo-Pacific to do it. On Britain, um, I think I, I agree wholeheartedly with that point that no one uh, wants or expects or even hopes to see, um, you know, the, uh, the Royal Navy in full splendour um, sort of steaming to the to the rescue of the Indo-Pacific. But that's not the point. You know, the point is that this is a, a sea of many flags. It's a global region. The South China Sea is everyone's business and it's the centre of the Indo-Pacific. And whether it is uh, the British or indeed the French, uh, the Americans, uh, the Japanese, the Indians, the Australians, uh, various uh, Asian countries, there's going to be uh, a, a balancing dynamic there as long as we're in circumstances short of 
fully full-scale uh, confrontation or escalation to major power war. And then, of course, it's going to be a, a different game. But most of the action, in fact, all the action at this stage happens at lower thresholds. And I would emphasise for Britain the, the non-military engagement in the Indo-Pacific. I mean, if you look at what small and middle countries in the Indian and Pacific Oceans need, they need the ability to make wise decisions about how to spend Chinese money or how to reject Chinese money and how perhaps to accept other money or uh, change their development pathways. And so any kind of experience and training and development assistance in rule of law, accountability, transparency, governance is what is needed. And that should not be provided by any one country. And even a more frugal uh, or, or economically constrained Britain is going to have a big part to play in that. So I think countries like Australia would welcome Britain into the region in, um, in that regard. And then finally, that goes to the point about um, overest overestimating or underestimating China, because it's in China's interest to project three messages. Uh, one is that China's rise is, and China's dominance is inevitable. Secondly, that China's dominance is benign. And thirdly, that you will get hurt if you stand in the way. Now, of course, there's an interesting um, set of contradictions within the, the three parts of the message, but that's what they are. And it's important to interrogate all of those aspects of the message because uh, in many ways, the antibodies, as we've heard this evening, in many systems are beginning to wake up. And in a way, the, uh, the sort of the, the antibodies of the antipodes, if you like, the Australian experience in countering and identifying Chinese influence, interference and coercion is instructive for the whole world. And so far, Australia is willing to pay the price um, of, of, of that instruction. Um, this is, in the end, about achieving a settling point with China. It's not about uh, desiring confrontation. It's certainly not about containment. And it's certainly not about wishing for, um, I guess, the collapse or the unraveling of China. But it's about finding a settling point. Uh, and I still believe there are those in the Chinese system who, who can do that. In some ways, the right calibrations of pushback and respectful setting of limits uh, is going to help China, in the end, find that settling point too. So I'll, I'll leave it there. Wonderful. Thank you very much. This was a, a very rich um, conversation that, that span across a number of different themes. Perhaps the, the, to sum it all together, um, it seems to me that one point that certainly comes across in the book and what we've discussed today, we all must pay more attention within the Indo-Pacific to actors and, and, and uh, regional actors um, other than the United States and China. If we want to have a picture that is articulated and that allows us to grasp where the dynamics of the international security of this pivotal part of the world are going, in a way, I could sort of uh, 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 turn the point that you raise in the book and is we really need to pay attention to what kind of maps the different actors are using because these will tell us um, or give us an indication of where the possible direction of travel is. Um, the second point that I take away from the conversation is that in, in this process of paying attention to others, um, I think what comes across, uh, particularly for actors like the UK, like some of the European actors who are um, in a way external but intrinsically connected and integrated with the region through connectivity global trade, um, there is an increased interest in retaining some strategic visibility in that part of the world. And as a result of that, play through alliances, bilateral relations, multilateral interactions in order to maximize the impact of, of that visibility. And in a way, it, it, it goes back to the point you were making, Rory, about history and the importance of the history. The Indo-Pacific concept, as we're discovering it today, it's a rediscovery of an idea that existed for a long time. And we discussed this before in the 1960s, when the Indo-Pacific was first yeah. used in official documents, was about linking to others because you couldn't afford to, but to do it by yourself. Which links to the last point, again, that, that, that came across very powerfully uh, during the entire conversation about connectivity and how connectivity, in order to generate prosperity and stability, um, it needs to sort of focus not just on matters of competition, 
brought on uh, matters of security and stability, whether it is governance at sea, whether it is rule of law, whether it is about um, economic management of debts and therefore increased uh, uh, procedures to ensure transparency and sustainability of projects, the Indo-Pacific is this overarching broader concept that allow us to sort of identify the different layers of the question. I am particularly grateful for the both of you to allow us to understand this in much greater depth. And before um, we um, thank you both um, in the traditional fashion. Uh, well, very quick note that some of the maps that Rory kindly shared with us today, you can actually find them in the book, as I will show you, um, in color, which these days is a rare thing, and perhaps it adds to the value to buy the book. Now, you're too much of a gentleman, so I'll do the sales pitch, don't worry. Um, I'll, I'll do it. That's all right. Um, on this happy note, thank you very much for every, everyone that followed us both on Facebook or with the live streaming and here. Um, and hopefully we'll see you soon with the next uh, webinar. Certainly we have another one coming up next week. We're talking with um, Sheila Smith at the Council of Foreign Relations on her latest book, Rearming Japan. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, Rory, Laurie, thank you very much for sharing your Thank talk. you. Very nicely done. I appreciate it. Thank you all. Stay safe. Bye now. Bye. -bye.